Hi, okay. When you are back in your seats, we'll make a start. Shall I sing a song while you do? No. <laughs> okay. So we've heard the overview from Eric. We've heard about the numbers and the cycle of 2012 from Mary. We've also heard from Joan about the rich resources that our community of widening participation access to HE practitioners have produced over the years through excellent programmes like Aim Higher and the work that Action Access does and lifelong learning networks and all those sorts of things. Uh, and so we have a real rich base, I think, that we should be proud of and be drawing on uh, as we try to help the government in their pursuit of social mobility. And I think we have a good story to tell as a community and we want to use that story to best effect in taking that agenda forward. So it is very appropriate, it seems to me, uh, to be welcoming our next speaker. He will need no introduction, I'm sure to you, given all the press and interest there's been in his latest report. Intriguingly called University Challenge, How Higher Education Can Advance Social Mobility. Uh, Alan Milburn uh, was here last year, so in a sense you're an old friend to this summit and we're delighted you could come back so near to the publication of your recent report to give us an update and also an overview of your analysis and proposals and recommendations. Thank you and welcome Alan Milburn to the stage please. Thank you. Very much indeed, John. Doesn't time fly when you're enjoying yourself? Right? Let's say the timing is everything in politics, so your conference is brilliantly timed uh, in terms of the, the release of the uh, report last week. Uh, somebody said to me it had gone really well, uh, and I said that was the easy bit. The easy bit is writing the report and getting the media to cover it. The harder thing is to get something done about it. Um, but that's where you guys come in, and hopefully where government comes in as well. Uh, so to begin with, uh, I'd like to thank you again for all of your efforts, for the leadership that you give, uh, not just John, but everybody in this room who makes a real difference as far as this agenda is concerned. And it's a very, very striking thing for me. But, uh, when I look back over the last, because uh, I'm very old, and I sort of look back over the last 20 years or so, and I see the way that this whole agenda around both making participation wider and access fairer has really um, caught hold across the university sector as a, as a whole. And I think it is genuinely one of those things where uh, you get the right combination of public policy being conducive um, and efforts locally being focused um, and that combination of top down and bottom up really produces change. The question for me I suppose a bit is what does the top down agenda now look like um, given everything that is going on and can we better focus the bottom up agenda um, to ensure in particular that the change circumstances and I don't really mean politically but economically that we all now face uh, are nonetheless still conducive to making progress on what is always a quite challenging agenda. Um, and certainly when you're sort of writing these reports and, and trying to think how best to pitch them to the media and so on and so forth, it's very easy to lose sight of the fact that although there is a big picture uh, story, uh, nonetheless what you guys are doing every day is dealing with individuals uh, and their circumstances vary, some are challenging, more, more challenging than others, um, and so even if we get the overall top-down public policy position right, nonetheless the biggest contribution that can be made to this agenda is not anything that any government minister can ever do, it is what happens in individual universities, individual schools, individual local communities, and that individual interaction between widening participation teams in particular and potential individual students of all ages, not just the young but mature students, which I'll come to in a moment or two. So I thought what I might do is because, in part because the, there was so much coverage of this thing last week, I'd sort of run through it very briefly and then we can spend the bulk of the time um, on, on questions and, and discussion and I'm sure there are lots of things that I got wrong in the report as well as hopefully one or two things that get what I got right. Um, I mean I suppose starting with the, with the big picture, 
the really important thing, you know, when I'm sort of thinking about these vexed issues around both social mobility and child poverty, and as some of you know, since last year, the government has legislated um, for a statutory commission on social mobility and child poverty, which I hope will go live next month. Um, I've been appointed to chair it. Um, we've just been through the process of appointing commissioners and so on and so forth. And it will have a broad responsibility to examine what is happening on both of these trends around mobility and poverty, but also to report regularly, including to Parliament, on what progress is being made by a variety of actors. The government, employers and professions, but also the education sector universities and schools. So I suspect that the spotlight that is currently shining is not going to dim um, in future years. So the commission is going to be a permanent statutory body and I think that's a great thing. It's a rare thing in my experience anyway for governments to invite more scrutiny of themselves. They're generally a sort of keen uh, at avoiding it. Um, so the fact that um, we have this thing uh, up and running I think is a jolly good thing. Um, and when I look at the overall sort of trend line, I think um, it's uh, becoming increasingly clear as our economy goes through its difficulties that it's going through like right now, but nonetheless the overall trajectory is one way, which is this is going to be an increasingly knowledge-based, value-added, highly competitive global economy, and where does Britain best compete? It doesn't compete at the lower end, it competes at the higher end. And so therefore higher education becomes more, not less significant for the futures, uh, for the country's future economic prospects, but also by extension for its social prospects. Um, because if we end up with a group of excluded and unskilled in a value-added knowledge-based economy, boy or oh boy, are we going to have something that looks a long way from one nation Britain, which all the politicians seem to be alighting on as a good phrase and sometimes occasionally a good policy. Um, so universities, if you like, um, over the course of the last 20 years, there's been a huge amount of focus on the economic good that universities can bring to our country. I think the balance and pendulum is sw slightly swinging towards the social good that universities can bring. And in part, um, my report last week was intended to make that pendulum swing ever faster. Um, I think when you look back over the course of the last 15 or 20 years, what has actually happened in terms of access to university is nothing short of remarkable. Um, both that the overall cake has grown, the number of students from all sorts of backgrounds, mature students, part-time students, etc., has continued to increase. And the fact that at the same time we've been able to narrow the participation rates between low areas of participation and high areas of participation is, as Offer and Sir Martin Hall and so many others have rightly commented, nothing short of uh, remarkable. It's the first time in our history that that has ever happened. So, great progress, but as everyone knows in this room, uh, there can be and should be no resting on our laurels because there's an awfully long way to go. Uh, and we really shouldn't kid ourselves that somehow or other, for all the progress of the last 15 and maybe in particular the last uh, five or ten years in particular, that access to university remains anything other than inequitable. <coughs> Um, and when you have the most advantaged 20% of young people still seven times more likely to attend university as the bottom 40%, we know that there is a long way to go and that there is a very strong, unfortunately, correlation in our country between a person's social class and their likelihood of going to university generally and to the top universities in particular. So the shorthand, I suppose, would be great progress, not nearly enough, a long way to go, and some significant risks which now threaten that progress. A climate of fiscal constraint, a cap on student numbers, and a big increase in tuition fees are significant new headwinds which universities now face in making further progress. So without action on the part both of government and of universities themselves, the danger is that the progress of the last 10 years will be a historic blip that we will look back on it and pat ourselves over the back for a job well done, but we will regret the fact that it was unsustainable. Um, and I think that will have profound consequences for the ambition that is widely shared in this country amongst all the political parties, but more importantly by the public themselves, 
that we should be aiming for a society that is far more mobile and far more fair. Um, so therefore, um, there is some stuff to do. And what the report that um, I published last week tries to do, I suppose, is examine government policy on higher education to begin with and make some recommendations as to how social mobility considerations can be made far more central to the operation of higher education policy. Um, I welcome policies such as the government's extension of student loans to part-time students, the strengthening of offer, and so on. But I do express a, a series of concerns about a number of policy areas which I think will have unintended consequences that will damage the government's ambition for social mobility in Britain. So let me highlight just briefly three. First of all, on tuition fees. Um, I think the doomsayers who uh, predicted that um, there would be a wholesale drop-off in applications uh, have been proven wrong. The total numbers applying to university this year, as ministers are keen to um, uh, repeat, are the second highest on the record. Nonetheless, as I, I heard a bit of what Mary was saying, for the first time since 2006, the proportion of applications from young people has fallen, and more worryingly still, the fall in application rates from young people living in the most disadvantaged areas is a real cause of concern. It's actually not the biggest cause of concern. I think the, the two uh, principal concerns are twofold. First of all, uh, a regional, if you like, a locational or geographical concern across all age groups, the regions with the lowest participation rates, the southwest and my part of the world, the northeast, so the steep falls in applications. And then secondly, the wholesale drop-off in applications from mature students of between 15 and 20 percent is of particular concern, not least in the context of a 50 percent growth in the number of mature students admitted to higher education between 2007 and 2010. And that suggests that fees have had a deterrent effect on older cohorts of potential students. I think there is a very real danger that the government has underestimated to what extent fear of debt is part of the DNA of Britain's least well-off families. Uh, I think if the government were honest about it, it has struggled to successfully communicate exactly what its changes mean for potential students. And there's quite a lot of mixed messages around. So in the report, I recommend, as you know, that the government should review how it is communicating with potential, student, uh, potential applicants and their families, and in particular, broaden its efforts, efforts to part-time and mature students. That work should start immediately with the aim of having a more effective approach in place for the 2013-14 recruitment process. Second big concern that I have is about the cap on student numbers. Um, when I look at our global competitors, um, who also, incidentally, have their own significant budgetary pressures, by and large, they're continuing to invest in higher education and grow their student numbers. We are not. We stand outside of the norm. We are an exception to the rule. I do not believe that a reduction in student places is a sustainable proposition, either economically or, as I indicated earlier, socially. So in the report, I recommend that the government reconsiders the total allocation of resources towards higher education. Uh, I fully understand the short-term public spending constraints that this or indeed any government would face, but it's an interesting thing.